Hello DevOps friends, welcome. Full stack is live again. Welcome to my DevOps live stream. Happy to have you here. I hope every one of you is safe and sound. I definitely am. I'm uh, happily sitting in my home office. Um, the weather outside is not very enti enticing to go outside. Uh, my the rest of my family still did go outside to go to the park and meet a few friends um, but um, that only leaves a little bit more um, uh, solitude for me to do my work here so uh, I'm happy that I'm here and um, I'm going to pick up where I left off yesterday I uh, have started to apply uh, software engineering principles a little bit to our chef cookbooks we use chef to automate our infrastructure we run uh, a few hundred Linux servers and um, automation is key for us because we are such a tiny team and chef helps us to do that and as I explained yesterday I only uh, realized recently that um, we need to apply the same rigor that we apply to um, normal application development to our chef cookbooks as well. And uh, that means that clean code principles should apply to chef code as they do to other application code. I think the, uh, the trap that I fell into was that things start out simple and um, so you basically um, apply simple principles or don't apply any principles because it's uh, stuff is easy to maintain while um, it's only a few lines of code. Whereas if you, for example, start with a full-fledged framework such as Ruby on Rails, um, even the um, freshly initialized application is already quite complex. You, you get um, uh, the whole directory structure and um, you know that there are going to be controllers and models and views and service objects and uh, additional gems and things like that. So um, I think um, this instills a little bit of um, awareness that it's that it makes sense to um, do proper coding from day one. Uh, whereas if you start with um, chef it's easy to download the apache cookbook and then set up your web server or um, any other cookbook and um, you only need to write a few lines of code to get things rolling and uh, who uh, has difficulties maintaining a few lines of code um, after 10 years running chef we do have quite a few lines of code laying around in our cookbook mono repo and um, uh, we might be late to the software engineering game in terms of uh, our infrastructure automation but better late than never and um, so that's what I'm going to do today um, I try and uh, clean up our code by uh, extracting code into uh, separate and isolated uh, object classes and things like that. Now, um, if you have any questions, ask in chat. If you have anything else that you'd like to share or if there is uh, something that you'd like to uh, contribute, um, pop into chat and uh, let us know. Uh, this is a very, very interactive channel and I enjoy talking with you about uh, all things DevOps. So uh, don't hold back and uh, let's make this um, quite a lively um, exercise here. All right. Um, well, uh, I don't think I have much else to tell you at the moment because um, since I wrapped up my stream uh, yesterday evening, uh, not too much did happen. I can't remember anything of significance, so I guess it's time to start things up. And here we are in 
our Fry Steelbox Data Cookbook. And this cookbook is a little bit special because it does not have any recipes as normal chef cookbooks normally do. And that's because uh, Fry Steelbox Data is an auxiliary cookbook that uh, simply is supposed to provide um, libraries um, with uh, class definitions that we can use in our actual infrastructure cookbooks. So, um, for example, and that's the most prominent feature of this cookbook, we have the website class here. Our chef cookbooks, since we are running a managed hosting platform, um, have to deal with uh, websites. For each website we run for our customers, uh, we need to set up uh, web servers and uh, shared storage and, and all these things. So, um, uh, a website is a pretty central object in our infrastructure. Chef um, has kind of a data store built in, which is called Data Bag Items. And that's basically a collection of JSON files or JSON documents. Um, and uh, we are using this to store the details of each website. So um, a data bag item of the website's data bag contains the details of a single uh, website. And um, these uh, details are mostly listed up here in this um, symbol array. So each website has an ID, of course. It needs to be addressable. Um, it's assigned to a cluster. Um, each website at least has a main domain, if not a bunch of alias domains and co-domains. The difference being um, co-domains exist independently of the main domain and alias domains only redirect to the main domain. So, um, for example, if you run um, code on your website that runs under www.example.com, you would then uh, add the example.com um, Apex domain as an alias domain redirecting to the www domain. And if you have something like shop.example.com, which has its own code base, but is located in the same website application, it would probably be a co-domain. And there are quite a lot of other attributes that we store in here as well. On top of that, a class allows us to also process data a little bit. For example, um, we can um, turn the website ID into a site number by um, removing the site text prefix here. We can um, also create what's called a site name, which is basically an S uh, followed by the site number. So instead of site123, we then in the end get S123. Um, we can have a method all domains that um, merges alias domains, co-domains, uh, and the main domain into a single array. So we have a list of all the domains that uh, a website is assigned and things like that. So uh, that's all nice and dandy because we can then use that in a cookbook and I'll open the Fry Steel Box cookbook that configures all that stuff. And in here we have lots of recipes and uh, lots of lines of code as well because that's the central cookbook of our whole managed hosting platform. And uh, in the Apache cookbook, we actually set up all the websites. So, um, infrastructure-wise, we run Apache, and since we are specialized in hosting high-performance Drupal and WordPress websites, um, we focus mainly on PHP as um, the programming language uh, that our customers use, even if only indirectly by using WordPress and uh, Drupal. And um, so we run Apache with the PHP FPM application server behind it. And in this recipe, we still um, have lots of variables that we use inside this sites.each loop. The sites.each loop sets up all the websites that are supposed to run on a single application server. 
And uh, the list of websites is provided by the websites on cluster method that we call up here. Um, so this can be quite a long list of websites and then we iterate over these websites and do all the installation stuff. Previously, this list of variables has been even longer, but it's still too long. So we have some kind of uh, site ID and client ID. Then there's a site name and the site username and the site group name, um, site local directory and a site share directory, site temp local directory, lots of stuff. And all of these are separate variables. And um, that makes things pretty brittle, because if I mistype one of these variables, um, Ruby will be um, very accommodating by simply providing me with a nil value, because I'm using a previously unknown variable name, and um, the value of a new variable is by default nil. And that, of course, creates lots of uh, issues. And uh, if our test suite doesn't uh, catch these issues, we are going to deploy a bug to production and um, someone is going to have a bad day. What I'm going to do is um, make use of our newly introduced class. And um, I'm actually instantiating this class here in this line where I go into um, Frysteel cookbook Frysteel box website dot new and um, I'm using the data bag item to initialize this uh, object and now I can um, instead of using variable I can use method calls on this website object. And that has the advantage that typos are going to get caught already in the during the code execution because either I mistyped the variable name and then I'm trying to call methods on an unknown variable. So I'm calling uh, methods on nil, which is not going to work and will uh, cause a runtime error. Or I'm going to mistype the method name and that will simply trigger a method, not uh, an unknown method error. So in both cases, typos will get caught quite early and um, are also easily easy to fix because we don't have to investigate where this uh, uh, mysterious nil value came from. Um, it's pretty going to be pretty obvious. Now I'm a little bit um, confused by this whole namespace here. Um, and I think I might have um, uh, missed something because uh, as you can see here the Frysdale box data cookbook only has the Frysdale box namespace and under that there's the website class. Um, since we are using a different namespace in our Apache recipe that means I'm actually not dealing with the class I thought I was dealing with and uh, I'm quite happy that I caught that because that would have been quite a nasty surprise. So it looks like this class here is a predecessor of the class that I've just shown you um, and is instead defined locally. And yes, uh, it is actually defined locally. So here we have Frysted Box Cookbook, Frysted Box Website, and it only has quite only has these three methods actually. So we need to move that over into the new official class that we are going to use and make sure that the, these three methods are going to Oh, I, I, I see what I did there. Interesting. So I'm actually subclassing Frysilbox website for this cookbook and adding new methods to it. I see. So what happened here? I actually am using my Frysilbox data class, but I then was about to make changes to the Frysilbox cookbook 
and realized um, that the class doesn't provide things that I needed. So I simply um, subclassed this class and added the methods I needed without modifying the original um, cookbook. Which is uh, a neat trick, but can only be temporary. So um, there should have been a comment um, uh, with a fix me uh, prefix that uh, uh, told me that these methods need to eventually move over to the official class. And um, well, since we are already working with our class, um, this is a good opportunity to do so. So I'll copy these and uh, let's jump over into our website class here. And if I saw this right, all these things have to do with domains. So I'm going to insert them here. So, oops, I need to get myself custom to my current keyboard. I'm not using this uh, 87 key keyboard very often. I, I rather um, prefer happy hacking keyboard layouts, more the 60% layout than the 80%. Uh, so uh, reaching for the escape key will be quite a challenge. Um, so... Let's see. I had the alias domains uh, method uh, did override the original alias domains method because um, that one seems to be missing. Ah, I see. Uh, seems to be missing um, a default value if the uh, actual alias domains attribute. Um, so this is more or less. Um, at the moment, this has been, um, or let me start again. Up until now, uh, alias domains has been an accessor. So um, it's up here in the list of attribute names. And um, the initializer for this class uh, automatically creates instance variables for, for these. Um, what we need to do here is basically say, OK, um, if we call alias domains, we return either the instance variable or if this is uh, if it's, uh, nil or empty, we'll uh, return an empty array. So that's that. Uh, and then we'll do the same for codomains. And then we have the Apache alias regex, which does not yet exist in this class. All right. So that means we will be able to throw out our um, temporary local class and uh, replace it with the official one. That's that. Okay, so I'm quite happy that I was able to spot that. And um, I'll make this change because I already have a branch open for this cookbook. And so I'll be able to actually um, replace this with the original class. And we can also throw out the local class definition. Or we could actually um, leave that in just for, fur for future changes. And um, throw out the virtual methods that we've now provided in the base class. Okay. So let's close this just to not confuse me. Uh, let me see. What else do we need to do? Um, 
in my issue that uh, triggered this change, I have listed not only the attributes that needed to be added, which I did yesterday, we also should take a look at the recipe helpers in our um, hosting cookbook and provide replacements within this class. So let's open this up. Uh, that's in recipe helpers here. And let's see what this does. So this here is um, a method that deals with a hosting cluster. It does not deal with a website. So um, that's already a, a good example for how these helper methods um, are not as clean as my my uh, actual object classes are because um, this um, obviously is a bunch of methods that aren't even all related to each other and um, some are about clusters and some are um, about websites and uh, so uh, uh, we really should um, clean this up and um, what I'm going to do is actually um, add another class to my Frystebox data cookbook um, which is going to deal with cluster related stuff. But let's first um, finish the website stuff so I can get this context out of my head. Um, and here we for, uh, for example we have the normalize site ID method which um, removes the site prefix from a site ID which I'm passing in and uh, that sounds very familiar because that's exactly what the site number method in our class does. So we can actually um, replace all calls for normalize site ID with a website site number. That's something that I can do later. So that's already um, taken care of. And I'll simply leave a comment um, to do replace with uh, website dot um, site number. Uh, replace calls with website site number. Okay, next method, normalize client ID. That's uh, making sure that a client ID that has a legacy value starting with client uh, gets uh, replaced by um, a number in the 10,000 range. Otherwise, we'll simply uh, convert it to an integer. So that's also something that needs to go over into our website class. And um, just, oops, uh, just like the site number, I'm going to call this client number. And there needs to be an attribute and it's up here, client ID. So we can actually simply use client underscore ID. We use the accessor for this uh, instance variable. Which also makes it quite robust and uh, more robust against typos, for example, than using variable names again, uh, in this case instance variables names. So that's that. And we can go over here and add a comment to do replace calls with website client number. 
Then we have name for site, which need, which uh, use uh, basically um, uses the uh, site number and simply adds an S in front of it because that's um, what we use in the file system. And uh, this method already exists in the form of site underscore name, so we can later go ahead and. Uh, replace these calls with website site name username for site returns the same value because we simply settled for the convention that um, the site name um, is also the username and I think it would have been cleaner to simply uh, call name for site here uh, just to um, make it clear that this is a convention. Um, Dog meat, you startled me. <laughs> Welcome to Full Stack Live. Happy to have you here. Thanks for following the channel. Um, and uh, yes, uh, if you are new to the stream, uh, pop into chat if there's anything that you'd like me to explain or um, if there's anything that's unclear or if there's anything that you'd like to share with us. Don't hold back. So um, our class does not yet deal with usernames or user IDs or groups. So I guess um, it's um, time to introduce that. I'll go ahead and copy these things. And I'll add them down here. And we'll have to give them proper names. Uh, I guess we'll call that system username. System username and uh, site ID is site number. Then we have the system user ID. So let's add some underscores here to just make it more readable. And um, here we are adding 100,000 to the site number. And just to make sure that we are we can make this uh, addition, uh, let's turn it into an integer. Then we have the same for the client and clients are um, turned into system groups. So that's system group name. For client underscore number, that's the method that we introduced up there. And uh, then we, since the client number already is in the right number range of the 10,000s, um, we can simply use uh, group ID, system group ID, client number integer. So in this case, the replacements are website dot system user name. User ID. Group name and group ID. So I guess uh, our recipe helper method set will be pretty small when we are finished. Now, um, here we are dealing with um, 
path names, directory paths that are created from website um, details, namely the client number. And here I have difficulties adding that to our class. I'll need to think about that for a minute, because um, directories are very infrastructure-y. And so far, my class, my data class, has been quite abstract and um, very universal. Path names will only be used by, maybe only be used by the Apache recipe. Maybe another recipe, but um, does that justify extracting this method into this class? Well, I guess it does. I'll have to think about that. I'll skip these for the time being. And since they these at least are already methods, mm, mm, no, no, I'm, uh, that's not right. They are methods, but uh, the Apache recipe then uh, calls these methods and stores their results in variables, and that's uh, my expressed goal of eliminating these so um, and I can't simply replace the variable with a method call everywhere I I'm using the variable hmm. that is indeed ugly, ugly. Hmm. Okay, that's going to be interesting. And here, um, this stock root variable doesn't even call a method. It does call a file join directly with a bunch of uh, values, which might also be um, better, could be better abstracted because I'm pretty sure this stock root gets uh, calculated um, elsewhere as well. Okay, so site runtime equals site runtime. Site is a hash and we are just um, getting the value to the runtime key and storing that in a variable so we can then uh, refine that so that's definitely a candidate to be turned into methods. Let's do that. Uh-huh. I see. Good stuff. So... I'll add these here and uh, that's going to be a, a runtime accessor def runtime Something like this. And here we can simply use the runtime 
instance variable because runtime I hope is already yes it is an accessor here so we create the instance variables PHP version is also a an instance variable. Can even use the official accessor here. Oh hey Julian, hi, how are you doing? Everything okay? Good. So, uh, Reek something to offer here performs a nil check yes it does um, actually this could be easier be expressed with uh, an R huh interesting yeah this is all a very roundabout way of saying runtime or PHP version with the PHP prefix. And here we need to use the instance variable. And then we have runtime type and uh, runtime version which are simply uh, parts of the runtime information namely the uh, language uh, in front of the hyphen and the version um, after the hyphen so yeah these are going to become methods as well runtime type is going to be runtime split and then number zero and runtime version is going to be oops runtime and the second part and that's that how about me oh, i'm fine i'm fine um I had a slow start today, um, felt a little bit tired. I also, and that's why I had a, a little nap um, before doing the stream and uh, also had a big cup of coffee before I took the nap. So I hope that is going to keep me up. And running. And um, I also got myself a cup of tea just to keep the caffeine replenished. Okay, so we have runtime, runtime type, and runtime version. And we can use these um, variables here. Um, so, first thing would be site runtime equals website runtime. Battery is fully charged, ex uh, exactly. We can remove that. And uh, here we say website runtime type and here we say website dot runtime version and of course I'd like to eliminate these um, variables completely and that's interesting site runtime isn't even used in this file site runtime and that uh, Rubocop only discovered that when I simplified this here interesting yeah I love Visual Studio um, it makes things a lot easier
And the nice thing is I can still use the Vim extension to keep my, my uh, keyboard productivity, my keyboard efficiency, but uh, I have all these nice uh, IDE features that I don't want to miss. So let's see. Uh, yes, yeah, so all we use is site runtime type and runtime version. We don't even use site runtime, interesting. And everywhere we use site runtime type, we can now use website runtime type and uh, so on. So uh, we can actually get rid of this. And then here we say, instead of site underscore runtime type, we can say website dot runtime type. Do the same, and here, and here, and here. And we are already down three more variables. Nice. So it looks like all that's left are these, um, oh wait, we can already, well, if I already start replacing stuff, I can actually go through the to-dos that I noted earlier and see how things improve. So here we have um, calls to normalize site ID and we can simply use website site number instead. So let's look for normalize site ID here. Normalize site ID and that's site underscore ID. Okay. So instead of site ID, we can always use website site number. Let's take a look at where we use site ID. We use it as arguments here and here. Uh huh. Lots of places. Okay. So we can actually delete this, and then we can uh, actually. Substitute site ID with website site number. Here, website site number might actually be an integer already, but it doesn't hurt, just to be sure. Okay, nice. So, well, let's go ahead and uh, take care of the rest. So we can actually remove that. We don't need this method anymore. Let's do the same for normalized client ID. That's this one here. And instead we're going to use website client number. Normalized client ID. Oh, so we can replace client underscore ID with website client number. Let's do that. We can replace client ID with website dot client number. That's this one and this one and this one and this one. And that's it. Okay. Then name for site can be website site name. So we replace site underscore name with website site name. Site 
name with website dot site name here 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 not here oops what did go wrong here let's do that again nope already replaced Interesting. It breaks. Here, we are supposed to replace site name here. Site name gets a lot of use here. Site names is okay. And we're done. Okay. Panda person, welcome. I'm still working on cleaning up my chef cookbooks and trying to get uh, a little bit of order in here. Instead of uh, having a bunch of variables all over the place, I'm trying to replace all these variables with uh, methods of a single class. In this case, it's the website object that I'm using here. So we can go ahead and, for example, replace calls for uh, calls of name for site here with uh, website dot site name as this comment is indicating. So name for site is site name. That's what I did. So we can remove this method. It's not needed anymore. So let's go ahead and username for site will replace with uh, system username. Username for site. So that's the variable site username and that's going to be the method system username so we can actually delete that and say okay replace some um, site username with website system username yes yes and that's it and we'll do the same for site group name. Where we replace site group name with website dot system underscore group underscore name. And that's here and here and here and here. And that's that. So now we can get rid of this method. User ID for site gets replaced with the method call system user ID. User ID for site. No, that didn't work. Is it user underscore? No. Interesting. Isn't there a user ID for site in the first place? That's uh, surprising. Okay, so that's probably in the box recipe then. Wow, okay, that's surprising. Let's use AG. Uh, we are in the Freisebox data. Let's open a different terminal for the Frysteelbox cookbook, which is a user of the Frysteelbox data library. Um, so, user. ID for site. That's defined here. And in underscore sites it's used. And in repo.rb it's also used. Okay. So let's open this up. And look for user ID for site. So that's the site underscore user ID variable. Which we can replace 
with uh, system user ID, but we need a website object here first, as we do in the Apache recipe. So let's copy this over. Where's our website loop? Here we are. And now let's uh, use that site does not exist here. So I'll copy that to here. That's used here, and we're going to replace site user ID. with website system user ID. That's the only. Okay. Then we'll have the site user name. Flush the bombers, get the subs in launch mode. We are at DEFCON 1. Uh -oh. Attention, attention. Beginbot is raiding our channel. Lock down your passwords. Defend the channel. I repeat, this is not a drill. Defend the channel. Hey folks, welcome to Full Stack Live. Happy to have you here. Hey Begin, how you doing mate? I hope you had a great stream. Thanks for raiding us. We are doing infrastructure coding here. So um, I'm in the uh, process of cleaning up our chef cookbooks, which we use to run our managed hosting platform with uh, more than 500 Linux hosts. And Stupak uses a passive-aggressive attack. Well, that's uh, that's clever, and we don't have any defense for that, I guess. I sh I really should. Well, we are on Twitch, aren't we? So um, I really should have a defense for passive-aggressive attacks. But uh, unfortunately, this catches me completely unprepared. Hey, how's it going? Uh, happy to have you here. So, uh, not to be disturbed. Well, folks. Um, uh, you can still use the exclamation mark defend command to uh, defend our channel and uh, all our raid visitors can use the attack command to uh, try and counteract that. And while you're busy, busy doing that, um, I sneakily continue to do my stuff here. All right, so uh, we have site group name and site username. So what was I looking for? Yeah, site username. So let's replace that with website dot system username. Same here and here and here and here. If this looks a little bit uh, tedious, uh, what I'm doing at the moment is this um, recipe, which is basically Ruby code, um, just uh, the chef domain specific variant of it, um, is that um, we've been using lots of single variables as shortcuts for uh, specific values. And uh, variables have one distinct disadvantage, and that is that typos uh, lead to nil values, which are hard to debug. And instead, um, I'm going to use um, a class and an object of that class and uh, replace all calls for variable names uh, by method calls. And that way we'll get, um, in the case of typos, we'll get um, much more um, explanatory runtime errors. 
So let's catch up with chat. Uh, everyone's attacking and defending. And I consider the channel as properly defended. Agrasting says, bro, you better have some pancake nips. I'm sorry, I so I'm so sorry I don't have any pancake nibs. And even if I had, I wouldn't give you any because you did not sudo. All right, so um, now let's see. I guess we'll have to replace site group name. Site group name with website system group name. It's a unit system. I know this. Sultan, welcome to Full Stack Live. Thanks for following. I appreciate it very much. Site group name. As you can see, we, we've been using these variable names all over the place and uh, by using this object and its methods. Um, not only is it easier to read, not only does it trigger more um, easy to debug runtime errors if we mistype them, um, we can also replace these uh, method calls, um, the code of these method calls as we see fit. So, and in a central place. So uh, it makes sense to uh, do this, even though it's not too entertaining. Um, it'll make making changes uh, to this code a lot easier. So we have the site group ID here, and uh, there's a method for that as well uh, called system group ID. So we can get rid of that as well. Site group ID. And that's going to be website system group ID. Okay. Site ID is going to be the site number method. You can re uh, remove that as well. Let's make the editor a little bit bigger. Um, so let's replace site underscore ID with a website site number. Mm. Is it site number though? Yes, I think so. Needle game. Hey, good evening to you too. How are things? Guten Abend. Oops, no, that's all. that wasn't intentional. Um, so we can do the same with the client ID. That's the client number. Method. And we've pretty much eliminated most of these variables now. And there are only two variables left uh, dealing with uh, path names, and I haven't decided yet how to deal with path names, if I will extract them to my class as well. Everything's great, that's good to know. We shouldn't take it for granted that we can take, that we can uh, actually claim everything's great. Alrighty, so let's start this. Here in box.rb, in this recipe, we have the same um, chaos. Um, so I'm going to uh, do the same here, replace site ID with the site number method. Website site number, and here and here.
I need to make sure that I actually only replace references to the variable. Client ID can go as well. And we'll replace that with website client number, which is also creating a nice uh, symmetry, I think. Here we can't replace it, uh, so let's go here. And this can actually be replaced with the website object completely. Instead of referencing the original hash here, we can use the accessors that uh, our website class offers us. The neat thing that um, I did to replace uh, references to this site hash with my website class is that I actually instantiate my objects with the site hash and then I iterate over all the keys of this hash and create instance variables from these keys. So um, every key value pair in my hash will result in an instance variable in this object that carries the same value. So I can actually do a nice simple search and replace or a repl uh, in place replacement where I say uh, website cluster turns into website dot cluster. If, yeah, since this is the key, the method has the same name. Client ID, the same thing. So I guess I'm going to create a quick macro to, to make this uh, replacement. Um, we'll say website, then we are deleting the brackets, delete the uh, quotes and add a period. And that's it. And now I can run this macro here. Here and here. That's that. And then we have site runtime version. We can replace that with a website runtime version and this is website runtime type no that should be a ver uh, that should have a version here um, that's a, actually a, some kind of a little bug here the runtime itself should actually A version. Oh, I see. Yeah, the bug is that this should probably be PHP followed by the website PHP version attribute. And I think website.runtime does that already because that's what I coded earlier. Yeah, runtime returns either the runtime value, and if that doesn't exist, we already um, create a runtime value from the PHP version. So actually, this is just website.runtime. Nice. And here, site name, that is... website site name okay I 
guess we should return to a more systematic approach to replacing these variables. Well, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, site name. Let's replace site name then. That's website.site name. Site underscore name. Website site name. Okay. Then we have the site username, and that's uh, the method system username. site user home. These are these um, path names that I need to deal with later. Here we have the site group name. That's going to be called system group name. Again, this is nicely symmetrical. Local, site shared, these these are all paths. Then we have site runtime. And we can replace these completely because we've done that already. And this is duplicated code that uh, I replaced already in a different recipe. And it apparently was simply copy and pasted over, uh, which is also never a good thing. Um, just copying and pasting stuff. Uh, so uh, let's deal with that now. Site runtime. It's not even used in this recipe, so it, it didn't have any uh, use at all. Let's just make sure. Yeah, runtime and runtime version were used here. And that's actually PHP version. Okay. Things get clearer now. Okay, all that's left is this uh, directory stuff and we'll leave that as it is at the moment. I guess I can close this editor. We have replaced user ID for site, group name, group ID for site. We already have path names in here, I just uh, realize. Oh no, no, these are the helper methods. We'll leave them in here. for the time being at least. Okay, that's enough cleanup. What I forgot is, um, or what I need to do now is to add a few unit tests for the newly created methods. Let's uh, take a look here. These are only path names. 
So we can actually close this and here we have more path names. So we can close this. So that is looking good. Let's uh, create a few tests for our newly created methods now. But before I do that, I'm going to take a short break. I'll be right back. Thanks for following and said, welcome to Full Stack Life. I appreciate you following. So yesterday someone asked, is it important to test infrastructure code? And the answer basically is um, infrastructure code is code and testing code is important. So testing infrastructure code is actually important. Infrastructure code, having tests for infrastructure code is, I think, even more important because um, you can wreak a lot of havoc by um, deploying code that doesn't do what you want it to do. Or that does stuff that you don't want it to do. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'm very, very happy that we uh, started to add tests uh, to our infrastructure code uh, a few years ago, because that um, makes deploying code so much easier and it also feels much better because I can pre be pretty confident that I'm not deploying something that uh, the person being on call um, needs to take care of, especially if I'm the person on call. So um, yes, uh, I'll more than happily uh, spend the time uh, to add tests to my infrastructure code. And in this case, since uh, I'm dealing with uh, only a library providing um, certain methods, um, we only have standard Ruby RSpec tests that uh, are pretty simple. These are more or less uh, just unit tests that um, exercise a few uh, scenarios and uh, so adding tests for my newly created um, methods will be quite easy, I think, uh, even if that might be famous last words, but let's see. 
So how do I find out uh, what exactly I did change? Um, uh, open changes. So I added the client number method. That's supposed to return a value that's greater than 10,000 based on the client ID. And if the client ID still is one of our legacy IDs, starting with the text client, we'll remove that text. So we'll have to test these two cases. And I'll do that right below where we test um, the site number. Oh, interesting. Okay, I should have added more describe blocks here because that would make reading these tests easier. So we'll add that describe um, site name. That's the method we are testing here. And then we have the domains. We don't even test the site ID method, huh? No, we don't test much anyway. Okay. Well, we t test most of these methods in this single test block here. Okay. So I'll add my new test below here. Describe um, client number. It uh, converts a legacy client ID. I'll create a new website, test website. And I think by now I can pass in a hash with uh, additional attributes. In this case, I'd like to set the client ID to client 42. And then we can expect that website client number is equal 10,042 and let's uh, make that more readable. Here we go. Let's go ahead and run this. Let's see if it works. Rake chef spec should do that. Uh, wrong cookbook. This one here, rake chef spec. Yep, it does work. For the same method, um, I'll add a test for We'll return a, a current client ID, and that's, uh, I think, just a number. So in this case, we we'll just pass in 42, and that should return 10,042 as well. It does not. Interesting. Oh, our current client IDs are already in the 10,000 range. So I need to actually pass in 10,042 as a string. Bobo Joe, welcome. <laughs> Happy to have you here. You haven't done Ruby in years. Well, that's a pity. I think you're missing out. Uh, <laughs> I could always uh, almost say that uh, I haven't done anything but Ruby in years. I, uh, since I started uh, doing Ruby 
about 10 years ago. Uh, it's been my go-to language for everything, um, except that I've recently started using BASIC again in my retro Saturday streams, but that's uh, very much an exception. So uh, most of the stuff I'm doing is actually uh, programming Ruby. It's either um, Ruby in the form of Chef for our infrastructure automation, or um, it's uh, Ruby on Rails for our web applications, or it's uh, plain old Ruby for uh, command line applications and helper scripts, things like that. Um, uh, it, I'm, I'm pretty much living the Ruby life. You have done 13 other ones in the last four years. That's interesting. I uh, probably can count 13 programming languages uh, that I've used uh, during my whole career, but that's uh, more than 30 years. Uh, I'd be interested. How, how come that you basically switched to another language every three or four months? Oh, you just finished college. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, when, when I uh, was in college, um, we did... Uh, do many programming languages as well. Yeah, and uh, only uh, during college I did Prologue or Ada. College was the last time I did Pascal. Was it? No, it wasn't actually. I uh, did Pascal bro programming in uh, during my first freelance gig. And that was after... No, that was before college actually. I think it was before college. Yeah. Yeah, I'm dating myself. But, uh, well, look at me. There's no hiding. Prologue is actually, actually quite an interesting language with its uh, predicate-based um, code. And I'd like to revisit that eventually because uh, yeah, I haven't done any machine learning or, or AI stuff uh, myself except during college. And um, it would be nice to, to revisit that. But, as always, that's something that you do when when I have the time, which is going to be never. Okay, so uh, two new tests for our new um, method here. Let's see what else I've changed. We have the alias codomains methods that are supposed to have a fallback in the form of empty arrays. So, uh, yeah, let's test that. Alias domains and codomains both need to have fallbacks. Here we are dealing with the domains, so I guess we'll add that here. Describe alias domains do. It returns the an existing domain a list. So that's the happy path if I create a website that uh, actually has alias domains in this form we can pretty much expect Website alias domains to include foo and bar. However, it returns an empty list as fallback. So if alias domains is actually nil or non-existent, I can't actually force it to be non-existent, but I can assign nil as a value. Uh, I expect alias domains to equal empty array. 
Let's run this. Psa, look at that. What did I do wrong? It's not available from within an example. What? Oh, yes, of course. Um, it's actually include. We need the matcher here. And now it works. Okay. Same goes for the codomains accessor. So I can actually just copy that. And I just realized um, assigning nil here um, is more or less the same as uh, having a non-existent hash key, because um, accessing this non-existent hash key would yield the same result, namely uh, nil. So this test is actually quite realistic for the uh, path that uh, we'd like to prevent here. What's in my OPSEC? Happy to have you here! I've seen you in many other streams and I'm happy that you're following this channel as well. I hope you enjoy, I appreciate you. So, um, that's that. Let's run our tests for this as well. Should still work, because I've just copy and pasted everything. So, that's that. Um, now, what else do we have? System username and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, basically the site number, the site name. So we'll replace that with site name, actually. Can I save that? Yes, I can. Site name. Because that's the definition. The system username is supposed to be the site name and nothing else. And still, we're going to test this. Mary Joe, Hello! How you doing? Mary Joe is uh, a fellow live coder, and I recommend you check out her channel and follow her. How are you doing today? Good morning to you! I'm Grant! Um, cleaning up my infrastructure code here. And I'm pretty happy um, how it comes along. It'll make things so much easier. And uh, at the moment I'm adding tests. And uh, so that will make deploying this code all the more enjoyable. Because I can be confident that I'm not going to ruin someone's day by deploying this code on uh, a few hundred servers. What I use for testing. So since I uh, use... Ruby uh, as my programming language, wherever I go, um, the uh, test system that I'm using is called RSpec, uh, where I can uh, describe scenarios here and test them. Um, these are all tests that are um, framed by a describe block, and then I have examples with it. And uh, I'm th I think um, I've seen the same structure in JavaScript-based test frameworks as well. So it turns out that many test frameworks seem to be pretty, pretty similar. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to use. And um, all the other test frameworks I'm using are basically derived from our spec. So the syntax is pretty sim similar, which I like because uh, I only have to learn uh, one thing here. Good. So... System username is supposed to be the site name, and I think uh, that's exactly what we're going to test here. Describe system username. It returns the site name. So create a website for testing. 
a website object and I can expect website system username to equal website site name. That's not the most complex tests in the world, but uh, I think it's still helpful. System user ID is supposed to simply add 100,000 to the site ID. That's also easy to test. And still, I'm going to test it. System user ID, do it a user ID in the hundred thousands. Uh, actually, I don't need these variables, do I? Oh yeah, it makes things easier to read. Website equals test website. Um, and I have to add a predefined uh, site ID, site 42, and that means I can expect website system user ID to equal 100,042. Mohang Habo, welcome! What do you mean, unique shortcut pattern? On my keyboard? Oh, you mean... Uh, do you mean my, my key bindings? Uh, I'm using standard VI key bindings uh, in VS Code. I'm using the VI extension for VS Code. Which allows me to keep my fingers on the home row for navigation and jumping around. Um, even though this is a 10 keyless keyboard where I have dedicated cursor keys, arrow keys, <laughs> I actually don't use them. Um, um, as you might be able to tell, I'm a bit of a keyboard um, collector and I actually prefer um, what's called a 60% keyboard, which is uh, only the, the part uh, with the alphanumeric um, block here, even without the function keys, because that's all I need. Um, I can get around by uh, having multiple layers on my keyboard and switching between these layers with a function key. And with uh, the Vim key bindings in VS Code, I can do even more. It has its learning curve, as everyone who ever learned VI um, can tell you, but um, I think it's very well, uh, well worth the investment of time because uh, you'll get, uh, not only you'll get uh, um, very efficient in, in terms of keyboard shortcuts, um, VI is also pretty ubiquitous. Um, you get VI um, emulations in almost every editor in the world. And if you are dealing with Linux systems, as I do, uh, you can expect VI to be installed on every basic Linux distribution. So uh, uh, that was what, what in the end actually brought me to VI. I've always found VI too complicated to learn because why, why learn these complicated uh, uh, alphanumeric things if you have your arrow keys and if you have an IDE that uh, gives you keyboard shortcuts? Um, and then I realized, well, every time I'm logged in into one of our many hundred systems, um, I don't actually have my IDE. I don't have, the, uh, I don't have sublime text or something like that. And... Um, what I do have is Vim, uh, which is the uh, improved version of Vim uh, of VI, and um, so I thought, well, 
let's at least learn the basic Vim shortcuts. And I learned them and then I realized, oh, there's a logic behind all this. There's actually um, a grammar that uh, once you uh, know the grammar, you can actually memorize everything what, uh, of, these, uh, of these shortcuts. And um, yeah, that's what basically broke the dam and uh, I uh, got into uh, using Vim as my daily editor and I ha always have been using Vim for, for the last um, five to ten years, I'd say, um, after trying a lot of other um, editors as well, of course. Uh, and now I'm even using the Vim extension for VS Code because I switched to VS Code because it's much more visual. Um, so the visual in VS is actually true. And I like being able uh, to use my favorite font, which is Operator Mono. Um, I like uh, getting visual feedback on, on errors or style violations and things like that. But still, I'd like to keep my Vim key bindings and uh, so I can get best of both worlds. Now, um, where are we? Yeah, I think we can now run this test as well. And My tests goodness. are working. That's nice. Welcome, Lakshan and Mohang Habo. Welcome to Full Stack Live. Love having you here. It's a unique system. I Unix. appreciate all of you. So, um, system user ID, that's that. I'm getting distracted here. System group name and group ID should follow the same pattern. Uh, I guess we can actually pretty much copy this and say instead of username, we can say group name. Let me illustrate what I like about Vim. Um, if you're not familiar with Vim, uh, and apparently you aren't, um, let's make this uh, so. Here I have a um, system username and I'd like to replace the user part with group. I can tell my Vim key bindings the same thing that I would tell you if I would remote control you. For example, if we would um, do some pair programming, I would tell you now replace the part until the next underscore uh, with group and that's it. And that's exactly what I'm going to tell uh, VI here, or the Vim key bindings, because I'll press C for change, T for two, and then underscore, which means change everything until the next underscore character. And since I've pressed C for change and not D for delete, I'm already in input mode, so I can go ahead and type group and uh, now I press escape to get out into command mode again, and that's my change done. Now, here it says, um, returns the site name, and of course, um, I'd like it to uh, say, returns the group name. What do I have to do? Replace everything until the next underscore with group. Well, I've already done that. So I can simply press period to say, do the same thing that you just did again. And uh, here we go. So username should be group name. I press period and it does it. And group name. returns C followed by the client number and I'm pretty sure that that's actually the client name, isn't it? Uh, we don't have a client name method at all. Okay, so we don't need this client name method. Okay. Okay, so we'll have to write a full test for this. And the neat thing is um, this grammar applies to, to everything. So, um, 
I'll uh, I'll explain my next few changes as well, but uh, I'll need to actually read what I'm doing here. System group name returns the uh, group name. Uh, this is normal editing, so I'm not going to comment on that. Returns the group name based on the client ID. Uh, expect website. Yeah, we'll have to define a specific client ID. Of course, I'm going to use 42. So the system group name should equal client 42. In VS Code, you can search for pattern selected and press Command D to select all other matches to edit all at once. I guess it's the same function. It's similar. I can do the same in, in VI where I say um, replace everything um, that you can find. Um, it's a little bit different from what I did here, but um, uh, with the period which repeats the previous command, I, I can basically manually um, emulate what you just described. Oh, hey, Julian. Uh, we have a failure. Why did we have a failure? Oh, it's not client 42, it's C42. So we are a little bit abbreviated. So now, I'd like to get rid of the client part in client. Um, and I'll do the same or something similar as I did before. I'd, I'd like to delete everything up to the 4. So I'm pressing D for delete, T4. And uh, since I this time I use delete. It doesn't put me into input mode. I'm, I'm back in command mode, so I can um, keep uh, navigating my cursor around. The other thing I could have done, and uh, that's just to illustrate um, that there is a grammar, um, I can also say um, delete everything up and including the T. And that's D, F for find, T. Does the same thing, of course. I can use these T and F commands also to navigate by not prefixing them with a C or a D, because I don't want it to change anything. I don't want to delete anything. I just would like to jump to the quote sign. So I'll press F, quote, and it gets me there. Or if I would like to extend the string inside these um, quotes, um, I can say T, quote sign, to jump to the location left of the quote sign. And here I can now uh, insert something. So just by learning T means left of what I press next, and F means right on top of uh, what I type next. Um, just by memorizing these two things, I can also um, change everything up to a certain character, or I can delete everything up to this character. And um, that's what I meant with um, once you have this grammar memorized, uh, it's so logical um, that um, it's easy to um, keep a lot of uh, keyboard shortcuts in memory. YBN, hello! Long time no see! Is there a right way to read gem source files to look for something that is not in the docs? A right way? Uh, I'm not sure if there is something that I, that I can recommend here. So my approach, if I would, maybe you can be a little bit more specific for what you have in mind, then I guess I can try and, and help you in a more specific way. To look for something that is not in the docs. Um, my approach would be to go um, to Ruby Gems to look for the gem and then uh, jump to GitHub or wherever the source code is and then use the uh, uh, the features the, the that GitHub provides me with. 
So my normal approach say, I'd like to take a look at the um, Rubocop jam, for example. Uh, I have a system search uh, where I can simply type gem Rubocop and that's going to open, uh, that's, that's going to do a, a gem search on rubygems.org and uh, here I have Rubocop. Of course I have Vim key bindings in my browser as well. So if I press F, um, all links will be highlighted with um, a key so if I'd like to navigate to Rubocop, I'll simply press K and that will get me to the Rubocop gem without ever leaving my keyboard or having to reach for the mouse, which is uh, miles away to the right. And uh, here we have uh, on the right the uh, sidebar with the links. So I'll press F again and the change log is M. So I'll press M. And here's the change log. I actually have no idea why I just uh, jumped to the change log because I'd like to jump to the source code. So I'll press um, capital H to go back in the history and I'll press um, F again. Source code is behind SM so I'll press SM and I'm on GitHub. It does not always work with hamburger uh, menus. Uh, by the way, the extension that I'm using here is called Vimium. Um, and uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on how these hamburger menus are implemented. And here I can uh, now uh, jump into the source code and uh, I could use my Vim key bindings or if I have actually uh, memorized the GitHub shortcuts that this specific website provides, I could use them as well. Lone Wolf, uh, welcome by the way. Hi, how are you doing? And uh, yes, you are right. You can actually gem open gem name. If you have that gem installed, um, then it'll open uh, the source code to your gem wherever it is on your local file system. That's a very convenient way to jump to the directory because the, the path to your gems usually is a, a very complicated one. Alrighty, so um, let's uh, go back to here. My test is already fixed. Uh, I should be able to run my tests successfully now. Yes. Nice. So we have system user ID, I have system group name, I guess uh, next will be system group ID. Same thing here, CT underscore and replace that with group. I can simply say CW for change the word I'm on that will delete the word and uh, put me into input mode. Returns a group ID in the hundred thousands. I'm not sure about that. Uh, no, it just turns the client number into a number. So it, uh, let's uh, say, returns a group ID based on the client ID. I'll do CT quote to change the rest of this string based on the client ID. So if I have a client ID of uh, 42, and 42 should be a string, then I can expect the system group ID to equal no, client ID needs to be already in the 10,000s. So it's uh, actually 10,042 and it should return the integer 10,042. Let's make sure that's the case. Shatla, welcome to Full Stack Live. How are you doing? Thanks for following. I appreciate it. Yep, I was right. 
tests are green. Now, I guess uh, I'll implement the missing tests for runtime, runtime type and runtime version, and then I'm going to be done for today. Uh, let's see. So we'll open a new describe block. In this case, it's going to be runtime. What does runtime do actually? Oh, it returns either runtime if that um, object attribute exists or otherwise it, it's going to fall back on the PHP version attribute and simply prepend PHP. Uh, that's because we started only supporting PHP in our hosting platform. So the PHP version attribute uh, does exist on all, all our website um, objects. Uh, but we'd like to extend that to other languages as well, for example, to um, Node.js or JavaScript. And uh, that's why we've introduced a more generic attribute named runtime, um, which uh, should be uh, reflecting the PHP version anyway, It's uh, if, if we have PHP version. But our old objects uh, will not have a value for runtime, so we'll always fall back to PHP dash and the PHP version that it's that is uh, guaranteed to exist. So uh, that's exactly what I'm going to describe here. Um, it uh, returns an existing runtime value. That's the happy path. So if I create a test website that has a runtime attribute, say PHP 7.2, then I can expect website runtime to equal exactly that. That's the standard behavior. However, if the runtime does not exist, it falls back to the PHP version if not defined. So if I create a website where runtime is not existent, uh, runtime is nil, but PHP version is uh, 7.2. Well, let's use 7.4 uh, just for variety's uh, sake. Uh, we can expect website runtime to equal PHP dash seven period four. That's that. Let's see if this works. That's great. And from here, it's uh, not a lot of work to also get uh, describe runtime type. It returns the well, runtime type left of the dash. I mean, we could actually even uh, do something like node dash uh, 10, for example, or 12. Now I can expect website runtime type to equal node. Same goes for runtime version. In this case, I'd like to use something um, more complex. Uh, I'll go back to PHP because there's a, a, an actual period in the version and that might cause issues. So in this case, the runtime version is expected to equal 7.4. How did I change this? Uh, let's, let's go back to, to Vim basics. Uh, of course, I could say, CW to change the word node. 
and get into input mode and then uh, enter 7.4. But uh, if this is a longer string, um, there is a different way. And you would not say, well, change the next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words and replace them with the following text. Um, you would simply tell someone, well, replace the stuff inside the quotes with your text. And that's exactly what I'm doing to do, going to do. I'll say C for change, I for inside, quote, and that deletes everything within these quotes. And since I've pressed C, I'm already in input mode and I can rip, uh, just type 7.4 and uh, that's it. So if I would like to, uh, for example, replace this text here, um, that would be uh, a lot of work to go back and delete everything and then retype my string. Instead, I can simply say CI quote signs, everything is deleted and then I can replace it with whatever I like. So that's that. As you can see, once you've memorized these things, C is always change, which means first deleting stuff and then going into input mode. And uh, you just have to tell it what exactly to change. And there's a grammar for that. Delete everything inside the quote signs, delete everything inside um, the parentheses, and then replace it or something like that. Um, then it becomes uh, very repeatable and uh, efficient. All right, so now we have 23 examples and uh, they are all green. So, um, yes, you should really take a look at VI. Um, don't get discouraged if it uh, appears hard at first. Just remember there is a logic to the madness. Uh, and uh, if I can be of any help, um, you can um, either find me here while I'm streaming or you can join my Discord server if uh, you have any questions and you can always reach me there. Well, except if I'm sleeping or so. But um, yeah, feel free to join me there and we can have a chat about Vim as well. Uh, I have a tools channel on my Discord server, so just pop into tools and ask away. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Good question, Lone Wolf. Uh, VI and Vim, are they the same thing? No, they are not. Vim is VI improved, uh, so it's an extended version. VI is a very old editor. Um, back uh, here, I have a replica of a mini computer of the 1970s. That's a PDP-11. It runs, of course, um, Unix systems from the 1970s, the original uh, Unix V7, for example, or the 2.11 BSD. And even these 50-year-old uh, operating systems uh, have VI on them. Um, and uh, uh, so VI isn't too uh, complex and can't do too many things. It has these basics that I've described, but I think uh, VI, for example, can't be extended with plugins. Um, so um, uh, Vim does have these features. Um, uh, that's the version that you find on all current Unix and Linux systems. Uh, and uh, Vim can be extended with plugins and all these things. So. Um, it's the successor. And NeoVim, in turn, is the successor or it's a replacement for Vim um, because the, the author of Vim um, is uh, quite set in uh, his philosophy. And of course, there are always people who don't uh, uh, match this philosophy and uh, that's why we have NeoVim. Actually, I'm using NeoVim in my, on my machine here. Um, it's just, uh, it's the same editor with uh, different innards. So, uh, for example, NeoVim can be extended in uh, other uh, languages, while Vim has um, Vim script as its plugin programming language. Uh, NeoVim, I think, uses Lua as its, its language, and uh, that's a little bit more modern, I think, and um, probably more extensible as well. Um, I haven't looked into plugin programming yet, 
um, so I can't tell you any details. But uh, NeoVim has a few very interesting plugins, and uh, that's why I've recently switched from Vim to NeoVim, which is quite easy because, um, yeah, of course, uh, NeoVim builds on everything that Vim has built up in the last two decades or so. Or three. No idea. The Vim extension I'm using is actually um, VS Code Vim or something. Let me let me take a look. Uh, where are my extensions? Installed Vim. Yeah, it's just called Vim, version one dot fourteen dot five. Alrighty, with uh, that done, I've covered all my new methods here, which is also great. So um, if you've joined uh, during the stream, I basically replaced uh, a lot of variables in my infrastructure code with an instance of this class. And this class provides all the data that I had in these variables via uh, methods. So instead of using variables, I'm using method calls. Not only are method calls much more robust than variables, now I also have tests that um, uh, make sure that um, the values I get from this object um, are as expected. And uh, so uh, even though this has been mostly search and replace, um, today and yesterday, uh, it has greatly improved my code. And um, that, that's what I call applying software engineering principles to infrastructure code. Uh, instead of just adding new variables, which are easy to mistype and will create um, very interesting results if, if, if mistyped, um, I'm using um, object-oriented um, approaches here to um, make my code much more robust. And that's something that I've only learned in recent years, um, that uh, infrastructure code should be treated just as uh, other application code. It's not scripts that you can throw in code uh, all over the place. Um, it's um, business logic that needs to be properly designed and uh, properly implemented. And if I have an object-oriented language like Ruby, I would be really stupid to um, not make use of that. So um, I'm pretty happy with the progress I've made here. Um, and I'm going to continue doing that um, in my next stream, which is going to be the day after uh, tomorrow. On Friday afternoon, I'm going to do a little bit more uh, infrastructure coding just to get this done. Hey, Slayer Darth, welcome back. Happy to have you here. How are things over in the UK? Um, yeah, uh, you might uh, not know this, but um, the, most of the stuff that I'm doing here on stream is my actual work. These aren't side projects or, or things that uh, I have um, constructed just for the stream. Uh, this is my actual work. I'm running um, uh, a managed hosting company and the code that I've just been um, working with is the code that uh, runs many hundreds of websites on many hundreds of Linux servers, uh, creating many millions of page views per day. Um, so uh, uh, that's why I can uh, do this stream during my work time without having a bad conscience. So um, yeah, uh, and since I have to get this work done by the end of the week, um, that's what I'm going to do on my uh, stream on Friday afternoon as well. Join me at uh, 4 p.m. Ireland and UK time, so uh, 3 p.m. UTC. Um, to see the conclusion of this uh, whole endeavor. So I've uh, had a really bad cold today. Oh, oh, that's... Uh, I'm not happy to hear that. Uh, hope you get better soon. But you relaunched your portfolio site yesterday, so success. 
GitHub Pages plus Checkill. I love Checkill, not only because it's Ruby, um, it's, it makes things so easy and it's uh, so well supported by GitHub Pages and Netlify and everyone. So um, yeah, that's, that's definitely a good choice. Will I have a baying mob if I misconfigure something? Yes, I will. First of all, we'll have many customers who are either disappointed or angry or both. And um, I'll have a very angry colleague because um, uh, they will have to do deal with the uh, uh, fallout in tech support. Um, I might also have uh, uh, angry colleagues or an angry wife, depending on, uh, on who gets uh, pulled out of bed in the middle of the night because of some um, odd call alerts. Um, and uh, that's all the more reason to make our code more robust, more testable, more maintainable. And uh, what I've done today uh, is exactly in that direction. How safe, dangerous is it to code on a live stream? Um, uh, well, uh, I choose my, my the, the stuff that I'm doing on stream, uh, I hope wisely. Um, but on the other hand, transparency is one of our core values. And you can actually look up our values. Um, if you go to our public company runbook, which is on uh, runbook.frysteel.it, I'll post the link in the in chat. And uh, under our guiding principles, you can see that uh, transparency is one of our co um, core values. And um, transparency means that everyone inside and outside the company knows what we do, how we do it, and most importantly, why we do it. Since transparency creates expectations in others, it fosters accountability. Um, and um, so um, that's the basis of why I'm uh, streaming my work, uh, making transparent what we do. Um, can also create trust in customers. So if, even if uh, customers watch this stream or the recording, and um, sometimes I encourage them to do so, um, they will see that uh, I'm going that I'm improving the product they are paying for. Um, and yes, I might make mistakes doing that. I might uh, take detours or I might learn something during my stream. But that's a, an improvement as well. Um, uh, they can see me getting better in real time. And um, let's be honest, uh, that's what happens everywhere. And uh, since we are, our cust most of our customers are web, ag uh, web agencies, developers, just like you and me. And um, so every one of us knows how our daily work looks like with detours, with um, bugs, with... Uh, epic fails and um, I, I don't see any reason to to hide that that I'm just like everyone else uh, in the end uh, our product will be better um, just only today I've added uh, I've replaced very procedural and very spaghetti code with object oriented stuff that is actually not only testable but also tested I've implemented the tests so um, things, sorry, things have gotten uh, a lot better, better within these two hours that I've been streaming or two and a half hours by now. Um, and uh, that's not something that I'm going to hide. Of course, I need to be careful uh, not to expose sensitive data, customer secrets or something like that. Um, and yes, uh, I uh, wouldn't have uh, created, uh, co-created at least, uh, uh, a very successful company that has been running for 10 years now without being diligent. Um, so um, uh, uh, that's not an issue. And yes, Slayer Darth is right, is right. Some employers may not be comfortable with you streaming your work, though. Um, yeah, you can't take that for granted, and uh, it's uh, 
probably better to, to ask for permission before doing that. Yes, and uh, the main thing is not to expose any security credentials you use in the code base and uh, customer details, um, uh, stuff that falls under data protection and privacy legislation, things like that. Um, uh, and yes, um, more often than not, I actually uh, committed uh, some kind of uh, API key to my Git repository and pushed that, and then I've I had to to rotate the key and uh, delete it from from GitHub or so. Um, errors happen, and uh, most of the time they can be mitigated. So that's that's not too much of an issue. And that's nice to hear. See, see, we're creating trust here. Uh, nice to see Mohang Habo that. Uh, uh, you actually like what what I'm doing here and the philosophy behind it. So, yeah, mission accomplished, I guess. And stream accomplished as well. Um, we have been doing quite a little bit of nice work. It wasn't too complicated and it definitely uh, doesn't deserve a Nobel Prize in Ruby programming, but it's been an improvement all the way. Uh, Mohammed, yeah, thank you. Um, Good, good to have you here. Um, so let's wrap things up, shall we? Um, I guess I'll repay Begin's favor and uh, let's raid someone. Let's take a look at who of my life coders colleagues is around. You can always count on Lana to be around. Uh, she's such a prolific streamer, I, I really am, admire her. Insta Fluff is there, Seeker Player is back, nice to see that. And there's Code Rushed and Assert Chris. Let's take a look at uh, what Chris is doing. Making a website with Next, so that I, uh, uh, I assume that's Next.js. I think that's something that I'd like to learn about as well. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, pay Chris a visit, shall we? RWX Rob is streaming as well. Uh, I, I've just found him recently and I, uh, I think we met there yesterday. Um, I, I really like what he's doing as well. Um, but this time I'm going to, to visit Chris and uh, yeah. Uh, you know what? While I'm uh, preparing the raid, do me a favor and copy the part that I've just posted to the to the chat um, that starts with slash me and copy that to your clipboard so we can post it to uh, Chris's chat as soon as we arrive. And who knows, maybe we get a, a sandwich out of our raid. It might actually work. So let's do that. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to slash raid assert Chris. All right, folks, as always, if you don't yet follow my channel, please do so and you'll get a notification uh, when I am back on Friday. You can also join my Discord if you'd like to continue chatting uh, or, or when I'm going offline. And you can also um, follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm Jewis over there as well. Um, and uh, now stick around while we uh, raid Chris. Thanks for watching. It's been tremendous fun and I hope to see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>